Hi everyone, this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and today I'm going to be discussing a bit of a weird one. I'm going to be talking about builder's talent in Bloombro Limited. So, not a standard color pair, just how to draft around this one particular card. As always, notes are available to follow along at patreon.com slash draftingarchetypes. So, because this isn't about a color combination, I obviously don't have any archetype stats that I can point to to say like how good or how heavily drafted or anything this is. It's just I've had some success drafting around this. I've talked to some other people who have had success drafting around it, and I wanted to talk about what's going on with it. It's a card. I believe it doesn't have great stats. I haven't like looked at the like average player versus top player stats on 17 lands or anything for it. I don't think it's very important. I know that the card is strong and performs well when you draft decks around it, and that it goes kind of late and doesn't do all that well in aggregate decks, and that's really all I need to know. So just looking at the card, obviously it's a slow card. Like, it makes an 04 and then costs a lot of mana to use. As far as its rate, like, a 2-mana 04 is a decent locker. It's You would not play... Just like a 2-mana 4 with no other text. But a 2-mana 4 that draws a card, like Wall of Blossoms or Wall of Omens, is a very good card. And in this case, instead of drawing a card, you get a talent that has the ability to spend 1 mana to let you get plus 1, plus 1 counters whenever you play a non-permanent, or whenever a non-permanent enters the battlefield under your control, which is relevantly different in this format. And then spend five mana to return a non-permanent or a non-land permanent from your graveyard to the battlefield. So, how much like value you're getting on spend five mana to get something back kind of depends on what you're getting back. In this format, you're usually not going to get like a five mana card out of it, but you will get like a two or three mana card out of it, and so you kind of get that like full card that you would get off of like all of Awesomes or something. It's just you don't get it as a card in your hand, so it can't hit, help you hit your land drops or something like that. But the value's there, and then you also get whatever value there is in whatever number of plus one, plus one counters you're making. I'd say if you're making like two or three plus one, plus one counters, you could kind of think of that as being worth about a card. In a defensive deck, maybe more like three or four plus one, plus one counters to really be worth a card. So. You do want to be getting value out of the second and third chapters, like significant value. If you're, again, just making an 04, it's pretty bad. But if you're getting stuff out of the other chapters, it gets good quick. So clearly a card that wants to be in defensive decks, very high ceiling, but a pretty realistic, like not very low floor, as long as you're playing a defensive deck and have you know, some reason to expect that non-creature and non-land permanents are going to end up in the graveyard, and that means that you're going to have some of them in your deck. So, I, t I did discuss Builder's Talent some when talking about Black-White, and I highlighted that it's really good with Carrot Cake. And I kind of talked about using how many Carrot Cakes do I have as kind of like the baseline for should I get into Builder's Talent. And... The more I think about it and play with it, the more it's like, yes, Carrot Cake is the best common to pair with it, but it works with a lot of different things, and I don't think you strictly need to be doing Carrot Cake. And I think if it's somewhat early in the draft, or if you have some amount of support for it, it's fine to just like take it and plan to draft around it. The other most important common, I think, is Fountain Port Bell. That's the one-mana artifact that allows you to, if you wish, search your library for a land and put it on top, basic land, and then you can spend one mana and sack it to draw a card. I think this card is pretty misunderstood. I think it's very good, and I think that you can safely cut lands for bells just one-to-one. -one. Like, I've seen people look at my decks and say, like, oh, you're only playing 15 lands in this deck. Well, I'm playing two bells, so to me it's a 17-land deck. I think that for your first roughly three bells, maybe even more than that, you can pretty safely just think of it as a tapped land. Like, if you keep an opening hand with a land and a bell, then you 
on turn one, play the land and cast the bell. So you don't get to use mana with your other thing. So that means that your first land functionally came into play tapped. And the second land, like you draw a land and then you play it and it's untapped. And now you have two mana on turn two. So it's the same as if your hand actually had two lands. Now you are down your second draw step, right? Like you had to draw a land instead of drawing something else. And so like if that had just been a land in your hand and you were like looking for your third land, then you're like one card less far toward finding your third land. So it theoretically costs you something in your ability to hit your third land compared to having a hand with two lands, except that when you sack the bell, you get that drawback. So you're like kind of down a second mana toward developing, but only if you have to spend that mana at an inconvenient time to make that development happen. So like there is a very, very small fringe cost in terms of it being like a little bit more like halting to your development than a tap land, but it's really trivial. So the big concern is, well, what if you have a hand that you would keep, but you have to mulligan because you don't have a land and you only have bells, or you just have too many tap lands because you have too many bells and the cost to like sacrifice them to get your cards back becomes significant. Like, Uh, An opening hand with two bells could be pretty awkward. So with three bells in your deck, you're just over 7% to have two of them in your opening hand. At four, it's up to 13. I think at seven, I'm not really worried about it, especially since that's not like 7% to have two bells and no lands. That's just 7% to have two bells at all. And if you have like two bells, a land or two, and some other spells, like not a big deal. But there is admittedly some risk once you get into crazy numbers of bells. The advantage that you get for playing Bell, like compared to, say, an actual tapped land that gives you any color of mana, like Uncharted Haven, is that you get an extra non creature spell cast, which could matter for prowess stuff. Like some of the otters have triggers on casting non creature spells. It's an extra card in the graveyard for threshold stuff and foraging. And It's an extra non-creature permanent for Builder's Talent. And most importantly, it is basically like an Uncharted Haven with Cycling 2. If you don't want it to be a land, you can just cast it, not search, spend a mana, sacrifice it, and draw. And like a land that is Uncharted Haven, but it has Cycling, is really good. Like, Fountainport Bell is, I think, wildly underrated in decks that are not splashing. It's not that, like, all two-color decks want to play it or prioritize it, but it's very reasonable to play in a two-color deck if you have any sort of other synergies with it. So, Bell good. Bell very good with Builder's Talent. And then, if you're prioritizing Bell to have ways to trigger your Builder's Talent, you will incidentally be able to splash extra colors pretty easily, which is particularly relevant because Builder's Talent positions you to be playing a long game, which means that you're going to be in a better spot to splash in general, and you're going to you know, have time to find your lands and your payoffs for splashing. So, And then this will expand the range of good non-creature permanent non-creature non-land permanents that you have access to in your builder's talent deck or just give you more removal or whatever your control deck happens to need so bell and carrot cake are some of the main commons to be looking for but there are some others but i'm going to set that aside for a sec poor segue sorry and talk about the other big set of cards that it plays well with that you might want to use Bell to splash for, which is other talents. All of the talents are non-land, non-creature permanents, so they all give you one trigger off Builder's Talent straight up. Some of them play significantly better with Builder's Talent. So, for example, Blacksmith's Talent gives you two objects right away, one for the talent and one for the sword that it makes. So you're getting just like two plus one plus one counters right off the bat for one mana. 
Caretaker's Talent wants you to have a token which Builder's Talent creates, and then you can like use the talent, the Caretaker's Talent to copy the O4 to get another O4, which is probably usually better than the one one you're generally planning to get off of Caretaker's Talent, and then draw a card. Now you have like this defensive setup and long game engine with your like card draw from Caretaker's Talent and extra counters from Builder's Talent. So those play really well together, and they're in the same colors. And then Innkeeper's Talent, like... Okay, if you have Innkeeper's Talent, you don't really need much else going on, but it's kind of cute that you get to level it up all the way and then double your counters from your Builder's Talent. And Scavenger's Talent, the one-mana black rare talent, and its first ability before you level it up at all is that when one of your creatures dies, you make a food only once per turn. So that means that any time, if you have both of these talents and one of your creatures die, you get a food, which triggers the Builder's Talent, which gives you a plus one, plus one counter. So Scavenger's Talent is, in the long run, probably going to net you more counters than almost any other single card in the set. So maybe even just the single nosed. So really good with talents in general and those talents in particular. So I want to take a moment to look at what the decks that pair these talents with Builder's Talent might look like. Some of them are more obvious than others, right? So like Caretaker's Talent plus Builder's Talent. Okay, we have two good white cards that want like tokens. They both really want Carrot Cake. They both are pretty happy to play a long game. Maybe you're like Green White X, just kind of a generic rabbit thing with like Offspring, maybe some food cards, Head of the Homestead. You could be aggressive, but you also use Honored Heirloom. The one man artifact lets you tap four mana and or creatures to draw a card at sorcery speed. You can play that really well, which means that you're pretty well positioned to grind with the card advantage from the heirloom and the caretaker's talent, the extra counters from the builder's talent, just a bunch of creatures to like block with. Your counters make them bigger, so it gets really hard to attack into. Blacksmith's talent. This one's like a bit weird because blacksmith's talent is usually best in aggressive decks. This is the one that makes a sword and then you can level it up to equip stuff for free and then you can level it up again to give uh, double strike and haste. So it's a bit of a weird pairing. Like you have an aggressive talent and a defensive talent, but blacksmith's talent does want a lot of mana invested in it and does give you a really like overwhelming late game where like you just throw your like very strong, like your well buffed creatures at your opponent one at a time and make them deal with it. So I could actually imagine building a red white or red white X control deck around both of these talents using valiant creatures because both builders and blacksmith's talent are good at at targeting creatures. And like some of the valiant creatures like whisker squill scribe the a card that loots when you target it, as well as a few of the ones that get plus one plus one counters when you target it, target them. The red white hybrid common scribes when you target it. So you're getting card selection and kind of growing over time. And so like the the valiant like the valiant payoff stuff doesn't have to be directed entirely toward killing your opponent as fast as possible. You can just kind of be accruing value and like bigger stuff and card selection using red and white removal and trying to play a long game where you're like actually grinding out extra value with the Valiant stuff, which I haven't really noticed an opponent trying to do. But I think that there's something there, particularly if you have these talents to kind of like support the backbone of the long game with the deck. Scavenger's talent, like obviously you want to be like a very, like you want, Everything you can that's making extra objects and you want to be playing a long game. And, you know, tip, typical scavenger's talent stuff, but it's going to, like, that, like, kind of abs and food space is going to play really well with both of them. So instants that make food are another really good thing to look for. That would be Saver, Cash Grab, and Paw Patch Formation. Saver is the minus two, minus two instant that makes a food. Cash Grab is the mill for put a permanent from among them into your hand. And if you have a squirrel or take a squirrel, get a food. And pop formation is the modal spell where one of the modes is draw a card, make a food. 
So with Builder's Talent, all of those become combat tricks. So it gives you appreciable extra value on these cards that are pretty good otherwise. And Cash Grab obviously has a little bit of extra synergy because if you see and don't take a non-creature permanent from among those cards, you can always get it later with the Builder's Talent. Of course, Share Pot is great with Builder's Talent. It's two objects up front and a removal spell that you can get back for two more triggers later. It's a lot of mana, so your deck needs to, you know, be in this waiting around and spending a lot of mana. But as I'm saying, that's basically where you want to be with all the Builder Talent decks. Fountain Port, the rare land, is another really big one to look for with Builder's Talent. Really low opportunity cost to put it into whatever deck you have, and it's just generally really good when you're playing long games. Also, you're playing Builder's Talent, so you probably are making a bunch of food, so Fountain Port will let you sacrifice the food to draw cards. And most importantly, when you spend four mana and tap Fountain Port to make a treasure, Builder's Talent will trigger and you'll get a plus one, plus one counter. So that means that your Fountain Port can be an onboard combat trick that is pretty easily overlooked, incidentally. So you'll get some amount of value out of opponents just like not playing around that, uh, speaking from experience there. And yeah, Honored Heirloom is very good with Builder's Talent, again, mostly because they're both looking for kind of playing long games and they both really appreciate carrot cake like you're you're probably going to be into making little tokens when you have builder's talent because you're playing white and you want to reliably have bodies to put the counters on and it doesn't necessarily matter if the body is big to start because you can make it big with the builder's talent so then if you have a bunch of bodies and you're playing a long game the heirloom will draw cards over time to find more non-creature permanents to give you more triggers Oh, Heirloom Epic, not Honor the Heirloom. Sorry, my mistake. Yes, Heirloom Epic is the card that I'm talking about. And uh, yeah, that, that's in a very similar space to Stocking the Pantry. A little bit less efficient in terms of mana on drawing the card, but also requires a little bit less synergy. Like with Stocking the Pantry, if you don't have other plus one plus one counter sources aside from the builder's talent, the stock in the pantry won't do anything some portion of the time. Whereas the honored Air, or the uh, the heirloom epic is going to be more reliable on its own. So pros and cons to both of them, but they both work pretty well there. Builder's talents decks would often like to be bark form harvester decks. Bark Form Harvester is the 2-3 changeling with reach that you can spend two mana to put a card from the bottom of your li- or from your graveyard onto the bottom of your library. You generally want to be planning to play a very long game. Ideally, you would like to have enough card draw and optionally cash grabs to get through your entire deck. And you really don't want to find yourself in a spot where you're getting deep in your library and you have to find a way to make attacks. Being able to just load up on your defensive creatures and hang out and not make attacks, even in the games where that doesn't end up, where like you do kill your opponent before drawing through your whole deck, the flexibility in your like strategic positioning in the game and your ability to not devote resources to finding profitable attacks and to instead only focus on playing a defensive game gives you value that's not obvious with the, like, that you wouldn't necessarily attribute to the Bark Form Harvester. Like, the Bark Form Harvester might not, you maybe you even, you haven't even drawn it, but the simple fact that you didn't need to worry about making attacks might let you use your other cards better in a way that lets you win the game directly or indirectly because of the, like, inevitability that you have. Um, regardless of how it's realized. Also, because these decks are prioritizing Fountain Port Bell, it's actually possible to get real value out of Bark Form Harvester putting cards back in your deck without drawing your entire deck. Because you can activate Bark Form Harvester a couple of times to put your best cards after you've used them from your graveyard and bottom of your library. Then you can draw and cast a Fountain Port Bell and choose to search your library but fail to find, assuming you don't want to land at this stage in the game, because it sounds like we've already cast a bunch of 
cards, used a bunch of mana. We probably have a good number of lands. We're probably trying to put more spells and fewer lands in the deck. So you cast Bell, you choose to search, you fail to find, and now you've shuffled all those good cards that you put on the bottom back into your deck. So you've improved your spell density and your card quality. And now if you redraw any of those cards, you're better off than you would have been if that hadn't happened. So you, you can actually get Bark from Harvester value more easily when it's combined with Fountain Port Bells, which is going to be relevant in any Bark from Harvester plus Fountain Port Bell deck. Or you can sub Heaped Harvest or anything else that shuffles your library for Fountain Port Bell. Incidentally, Heaped Harvest, another card that's totally fine with Builder's Talent. Yeah, so. You know, without listing literally every non-creature card and or every card in the set that makes food, that's an overview of some of the cards that you're looking for with Builder's Talent. Color combination-wise, I think that you're probably going to be red less than the other colors. Though, you know, I say that as someone who is just always red less than the other colors in this set. But I think red is less naturally set up to play the long control game than the other colors, even though I did talk about how it could do that. I've been pretty happy with Builder's Talent with any of the other colors. I kind of like pairing it with blue, even though blue isn't really contributing that many non-creature permanents, uh, just because the card draw spells and stuff help. But yeah, part of why I didn't really try to put this in a specific color combination is this is one of those decks where, again, because like Fountain Port Bell is such a big part of what's happening here, I'm not like colors are kind of a secondary consideration. It's more just take whatever cards would be good for what you're doing. And because you have bells or other fixing and you're playing a very long game and seeing a lot of cards, you can make the mana work out. So I do a lot of like splashing gold rares that, you know, where they're the only card of one of their colors. And it all works out pretty smoothly. So that's what I'm thinking about when I'm drafting around Builder's Talent. So I'm going to turn it over to chat for comments and questions. While I'm waiting for that, I do want to direct everyone to patreon.com slash drafting archetypes if you're interested in checking out benefits and supporting the podcast. But I try to get creatures with creatures with keywords since growing them is more impactful. Yeah, I mean, so anytime you like great thing to be thinking about, anytime you're putting plus one plus one counters on things, uh, the value of those counters is magnified based on the keywords that they're being attached to. I definitely want defensive keywords. So I'm not all that interested in keywords like trample, but I'm pretty interested in keywords like reach and flying because a lot of what's happening here naturally comes up the ground pretty well, but I want to make sure that I don't die to flyers. If you could get some counters with lifelink, that's pretty nice. And like in general, I think the like I'm more focused on getting more counters than putting them somewhere higher value, which is why I didn't put a lot of stock in like putting them on flyers, but it is a nice thing to look to do. Like Builder's Talent does play very well with like Plume Creed Mentor. I think that's the name of the blue white mentor. The two three flyer that puts a counter on a non creature. Or I mean on a non flying creature. Because, you know, you play the Builder's Talent, and you get no four, and then you can put a counter on it and get your bird, and then you have a good blocker on the ground and a reasonable blocker slash attacker in the air, and then you can get more, you know, counters with either of your cards. But some extra value, but I don't think it should be your primary focus, is basically where I'm at with keywords there. I said that Bell is a reasonable playable in a two-color deck with any synergy. What if you have no synergy? I've been happy with the first Bell, regardless of what my deck looks like. Yeah, I think as long as you're not, like, hyper aggro, like I earlier today was playing a red-white 15-land deck that was basically all one- and two-mana spells. 
and that deck wouldn't want Bell because I'm usually playing a creature on turn one. But if you have a more normal limited curve where you don't have very many one mana creatures and you're mostly things that cost two, then I think it's very reasonable to play Bell in a two color deck basically just as a cycling land slash like using, you know, a tapped dual land or whatever. Shrike Force is a reasonable call out specifically as a creature that's particularly valuable to put counters on. That's the one three flying double strike vigilance. Certainly, you know, I, I said in general that you shouldn't be, like, really worrying about the keywords as much as, like, just getting more triggers. But with that one, every counter is worth, like, at least twice as much as it's worth on another creature. So I think that's a pretty reasonable one to look for specifically with Builder's Talent. Another card that's particularly great with Builder's Talent that is a hidden gem is Night World Hermit, a good defensive one for a body that wears counters nicely with Vigilance and becomes unblockable to Threshold. Yeah, so I haven't really given a lot of thought to Night World Hermit, but it is very true that putting extra counters on a Vigilance unblockable creature is definitely nice. I, I think that that's actually something that I should look for some in the future. Is one builder's talent enough to build your deck around? Seems clunky to me. So it's not really, like... More of them is more clunky than fewer of them. It, clunky isn't really the concern. Like, the card does want you to be playing a long game, and it is mana intensive to get the full value out of. But it also does a lot to help you get to a long game. So, like, it's not like Builder's Talent is only good if you have multiples. It's a question of how far out of your way are you going to support this card, and if you only have one you can justify making far fewer concessions to it than if you have more than one. In my experience, they go fairly late in the draft, so if you have one and you've been drafting around it, you're somewhat likely to see another one, even though it's an uncommon, especially since as you're drafting around it, you're taking the cards that work with it out of the draft, so it's less likely that other people are going to be in a position to use one that they see in pack two or pack three. And I mean, I, I think the answer is, if you are set up to play a controlling game, you're going to naturally be interested in most of the cards that happen to work well with Builder's Talent, and so you can basically draft around the one that you have, and then you'll get, like, the payoff, like, this particular powerful payoff more often if you have more of them, but you're going to be like the deck will still be coherent with like if you just have one and your other cards just work together as they work together which is you know you have generally a controlling deck and your cards are all working toward that direction on the topic of cash grab how important is the number of squirrels you have that depends on what you're trying to get out of your cash grab obviously in the case where what you're trying to get out of it is a food for your to trigger your builder's talent you're going to need to have some squirrels but Impulse is not that bad of a card. It's a pretty good card if you're playing, like, a defensive deck. And then if you're getting extra value out of cards being in your graveyard because of threshold payoffs or things that get cards back from your graveyard in some way, that could be Bark Form Harvester, it could be Builder's Talent, it could be... Storm Chaser's Talent, it could be Hazel's Nocturne, whatever. Or if you have cards that do something from the graveyard, like Bone Bind or something, Orator, the 2-2 that you can exile to return a creature from your graveyard to your hand, or Persistent Marsh Stalker, the 3-1 rat that you can return if you have Threshold and attack with another rat. You know, there are a lot of different ways for putting the cards in your graveyard to matter in this set. So as far as, like, how much should you value cash grab, it's going to be, like, in a Builder's Talent deck, it's going to be a function of, like, are you doing other stuff that cares about your graveyard, and do you have a squirrel? How often will you have the squirrel? How highly do I value Builder's Talent in a pack one, pick one situation? I think of it as a premium uncommon. Like, I'm not taking it over, like, the strongest rares, but I would take it over most commons, particularly because... 
from pack one, pick one, you really get to, you know, plan your whole deck around it. So it's going to play pretty well. And I think that the decks that are drafted around it are pretty good. I think it would be totally reasonable, you know, if you don't have a preference for that, or if you have a preference for other strategies, like it's not hard. It's the kind of card that's really like, you know, it asks a lot. So if you value flexibility and if a lot of your ideal expected range in a draft is more aggressive decks, so it's really limiting your options, then it's easy to view it as a card with a high opportunity cost to take early. The way that I personally draft, I'm generally inclined to draft toward inevitability anyway, so it's not restricting my range or future picks very much. So this is very much the kind of spot where I think there are going to be a lot of packs where whether Builder's Talent is right for any given person really depends on their biases and preferences, and the different pick will be right for different people. But if you are inclined to draft control decks or the kinds of decks where builder's talent is good then it's very reasonable to take it very highly in the draft pick one is you know a fine place to take it as long as there's not a premium rare or you know top 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 to your uncommon in the pack in all honesty i think blue white's best archetype is builder's talent i agree i think that the birds thing isn't where it's at and Blue White really wants to be just kind of generic control deck, and Builder's Talent is a very good starting point for a generic control deck. You said you've talked to other players and they agree with me on Builder's Talent being good. They draft the same way as you. So the specific conversation I'm referencing on talking to other players and it, Builder's Talent being good. So... Neo MTG, I hope I have those in the right order, and it's Neo MTG and not MTG Neo. I think it's Neo MTG. Neo underscore MTG on Twitter. Organizes a call with various streamers before the first arena open of each set and records that and posts it on Twitter as kind of informal, not highly produced content and in that call i don't remember who but others talked about having drafted a bunch of builders talent decks so if you're interested in how they approach it and what they said about it check out neo underscore mtg's twitter to find that recording and hear for yourself it's hard for me to know if they draft it exactly the same way that I do or not without actually going through drafts with them. Yeah, so I talked about Builder's Talent in a slower red-white deck. I do think there is some potential possibly for Builder's Talent in kind of a more normal red-white deck. It's weird, of course, because the 4 is doing so little for you, and usually that's like a significant part of what the card's giving you. And I don't think you're naturally going to have... Like, you don't want to be playing a bunch of bells. It sounds tricky to pull off Builder's Talent in most, like, regular red-white aggressive decks. Like, it's really nice that it's a source of Valiant Triggers, but there, unless you have, like, a bunch of Carrot Cakes, and even those aren't very good in red-white, it's hard to imagine how you're, like, actually triggering the Builder's Talents to get the Valiant triggers, unless you're, you know, building it very differently as a control deck. In which case, the Carrot Cakes would actually become pretty good. All right, so I think that's going to wrap it up. So thanks for listening, everyone. Still, yeah, we're, we haven't really gotten into previews, so we're still well in the middle of Bloomboro. So be back next week with more Bloomboro archetypes. So... Thanks for listening and have a good week, everyone. And I will see you again then. Bye for now. Prepare for light speed.